Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is titled Sustainable Choices, Wood Products and Industrial Applications. My name is Warren Hamrick, and I will serve as a moderator for the session. I work for APA, the Engineered Wood Association. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood construction systems and educates users and specifiers on the product's proper use and potential applications. Before we start today's webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Katie's presentation will last about 50 minutes. To ensure that everyone can hear it clearly, we have muted all participants. We do encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel on your screen. We should have time to answer most questions, but if we run short, we'll be sure to post a Q&A summary on our website, along with a recorded version of today's program. We should have these posted in a week or so. A PDF of the slides are also available under the handout section of your dashboard. These will also be posted to the website in the near future. I'd also like to note that today's webinar is approved for AIA and ICC continuing education credits. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, an email will be sent to each attendee. It will include a link where you can get customized AIA and ICC certificates of completion. Our presenter today is Catherine Fernhold. Katie is, a, is president of Dovetail Partners, a nonprofit environmental think tank based in Minneapolis. She is a forester by training with more than 20 years of experience with forest management concerns. She has worked throughout North America on efforts to address sustainability in land use and material choices. She serves in many leadership roles in the forest sector, including as a board member of the American Forest Foundation, and on the Minnesota Forest Resources Council as a governor-appointed environmental representative. For those of you just joining us, welcome to APA's webinar on the topic of sustainable choices, wood products, and industrial applications. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Katie Fernholt. Thank you very much, Warren. I'm happy to be here, and, and thank you for the introduction, the housekeeping making sure everybody has the details they need. So let's jump right in, talking about sustainable choices and wood products in industrial applications. So you all hopefully saw the course description, what we're gonna cover in terms of looking at wood as a green building material and some of the Im environmental impacts around wood, but also looking at other types of materials and the environmental impact kind of comparisons between wood and some of the other materials that are used uh, within in for industrial products and for other packaging and these other systems. So here's the learning objectives. You may have seen these uh, as well. Uh, we're gonna start with maybe something that's a little new to most people, it's my day job, my wheelhouse, but not everybody's, but this is the conversation about ecological capacity. And that phrase, ecological capacity, might not mean anything right now, uh, but an hour from now, hopefully it will. So we'll touch on that, and we'll talk about also the relationship, the, the uh, social, relationship between people and forests, society and, and our communities and forests and how that's evolved and look at forest products, of course. And we'll get into some details around ways to quantify environmental choices, looking at life cycle assessments, as well as carbon accounting. And of course, look at certification standards as another tool of uh, the environmental impact and really getting into the types of materials that are used and the comparisons between them when we're trying to make environmental choices. Good, so let's jump in. And so for me, like Warren said, my background's forestry. I've worked in forestry more than 20 years and it's very personal to me. I mean, forests are beautiful places. They're absolutely spectacular. Even though it's my day job, I don't think I'm the only one that feel, feels that way. I mean, forests are just incredible and they're very important to us personally and within the places that we live and the experiences that we have. This is me uh, in one of my favorite places. And like I said, forestry for me is personal. Um, I got into forestry because I really wanted to understand the resource better and be engaged in efforts to care for forests. 
and restore them and make them uh, a vibrant part of our e ecology and our communities, you know, the social, environmental, economic benefits that forests can provide. So this is something that um, means a lot to me, and I'm always excited to share my work and, the, and what I feel so strongly about with other people that, uh, you know, don't get to have it as their day job. So forests are beautiful places, but these are the kind of images I'm sure many of you have seen and that I have seen when we think about uh, forest history and the impact on our forest resources in the United States. This is a picture from Washington State in 1940, and it really depicts an era in our history of forest exploitation, um, you know, where forest resources were harvested in a way that really was not taking into consideration the kinds of environmental protections and water quality protections, wildlife habitat protections, you know, that we have in place today. So this was really an era of exploiting our forest resources and having a pretty heavy-handed approach to, um, to removing forest products. And so this is, like I said, Washington State in 1940, and it teaches us a lot about forest resources. But what we learn, one of the first things we learn with forest resources is that even when something so devastating as what we saw in that first picture, or maybe something like a hurricane or a windstorm or a wildfire, even when something so devastating occurs and impacts the forest, forests have a way of responding to those things, whether they're natural disturbances, things that nature uh, causes to occur, or when there are things that people do to that forest, whether it's the kind of harvesting that would have happened in the past or the kind of harvesting we do today, which is much more low impact or much more moderated and informed by ecology. What we know though is that the forest has a way of responding to that. And so even five years after that first picture, you start to see young trees come, come back into that landscape and respond to that disturbance and fill in those gaps. 10 years later, you see those forests, those trees continue to develop. This is just 15 years after that first photo. You start to see that structure come in. We talk about that a lot in forest ecology, vertical and horizontal structure, because it's within those structures that you start to have microhabitats or important um, smaller scale habitats for particular wildlife species, or even different conditions in the understory that support biodiversity within the plant community. So even here, just you know, 20 some years later, you start to see that structural uh, diversity happen, that vertical and horizontal structure. And then, of course, this is the most important part of forest development is when you get to have color pictures of that forest. So I'm joking, of course, but I always think it's funny that these that this series of photos capture the moment when this this particular photographer got color film, 1971. But I think it is it's dramatic to look at how that that forest has changed. So this is the final picture in this series. It's a 34 year old forest, and many you know many things have changed in this picture in term in, uh, including the uh, the loss of the the logging camp building they certainly uh, have gone back to the earth a bit but the trees have reclaimed the site and and there's a forest on this site that has many uh, ecological and social and economic benefits and i'd like to share this series of pictures for a couple reasons one it's a it's a reminder of how you can't change the past we can't undo the era of exploitation of our forest resources in the u.s that is part of our history but we do have the opportunity to learn from that. And one of the things that the forest profession has really learned from that is not just the resiliency of nature and really really valuing that and being grateful for that capacity of nature to respond to natural disturbance or to things that, that people do. That resiliency of nature is one of the things we've learned, but we've also learned how to work with that resiliency, how to study it and understand it and incorporate it into our management. So that, like I said, today when we do forest management, whether it's a regeneration harvest, what we might have in the past referred to more commonly as a clear cut, but today it's practiced quite differently than it was generations ago. But even a fairly intensive forest management operation like a regeneration harvest is done in a way to protect soil resources, water quality, and, and ensure that the forest that regrows after that harvesting activity is diverse and vibrant and ecologically uh, sustainable in, in, the, in the way that it's planned in the way that it's managed and cared for over time. So we've learned a lot over the last really 100 years about U.S. forest ecology, about North American forest ecology, 
And we use that to inform our management and how we design our management today, including how we design the areas that we protect and that we don't remove products from, because that's a part of our landscape as well. It's areas that are actively managed, as well as areas that are set aside or representative sample areas. So I want to dig into this a little bit more. Just so, like I said, to get to that term ecological capacity that I mentioned, I want to dig into this forest ecology just a little bit more. So this is a picture, you know, satellite image of North America. I think many of us have seen these, these kinds of images before. And we know intuitively from traveling or even, you know, especially if you like the window seat on an airplane, we know intuitively that as you travel across this continent or other continents, the landscape changes, that there's different vegetation, there's different soil conditions, there's different climate, there's different conditions across that landscape. And we ecologists and other natural resource scientists can take that information about those differences and we can actually map what are called eco-regions. And that's really mapping those boundaries between where those differences occur in the landscape, whether it's you know, the forests, the grasslands, the desert regions, we can look at all the information we have about temperature and climate and precipitation, look at all of that information, and we can map out the eco-regions. And so this is a map of eco-regions in North America. And so each one of these colors represents a different eco-region, and those eco-regions can be described by the type of vegetation that they have the ecological capacity to support. So ecological capacity is connected to what kind of ecoregion it is, and given all those characteristics of that ecoregion, what type of vegetation or habitat will that ecoregion provide? So for example, this green area in the eastern United States, from Texas to Maine, Florida to Minnesota, I'm right there, and it's going to be 17 below tonight, so I got my snow boots and jacket ready, but there I am in Minneapolis. But this green region from Texas to Maine, Florida to Minnesota, this is a temperate forest ecoregion. And that means that that entire landscape has the, the soils, the moisture, the climate, the temperature, precipitation, those, it has the conditions to support forest growth and temperate forest growth, which can include hardwood forests in the north, more conifer forests in the south, but a whole diversity of forest species, tree species, inhabit this eastern temperate forest ecoregion. We go to the north, this light blue color is a boreal forest region dominated by spruce and fir forest types. This green area is a Rocky Mountain forest ecoregion. It's defined a lot by elevation. I mean, if you've lived in a mountainous area or you're familiar with mountainous areas, you know how precipitation patterns and different ecological conditions change with elevation. And that's what we see with this green ecoregion is a lot of those patterns are defined by elevation. And then we go into the West Coast. And this coastal, Pacific coastal forest is dominated by all kinds of conifer species as well, quite diverse throughout that range. and includes some of the world's largest uh, and most long-lived tree species. If you're familiar with some of the forest types in Northern California, uh, sequoias, redwoods, and those types of forests. So very special uh, forest conditions in that region. But if we look at this, the Pacific coastal region, the Rocky Mountain region, this boreal forest, this eastern temperate region, what you find is across North America, we have incredible areas that have the ecological capacity to grow trees. It really is a dominant part of our landscape, especially when you look at the eastern U.S. It, 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 uh, it dominates the eastern U.S. And then it also is quite important in the Intermountain West and the West Coast as well. These other ecoregions, Right here in the middle is the Great Plains, dominated by an ecological capacity to grow different grasses. Trees will occur, of course, within this ecoregion, but that's not the dominant vegetation, historically or naturally, given the precipitation patterns and other factors within this. And then this region centered around Nevada is a desert region. And so again, the vegetation is gonna be very different, not a grassland, not a forest region, but a very different type of, of vegetation and habitat condition. And California has a chaparral ecoregion. But you look at that Pacific Coast, Rocky Mountain, Boreal Forest, Eastern Forest, major parts of the landscape have the ecological conditions and the ecological capacity to grow trees. That's what they're designed to do. It's, it's within their ecology to grow trees and to regrow trees in response to uh, different events that occur in those regions. So this is the map that shows where we have forests right now in the United States, in the lower 48. 
the map, there are maps available that include Alaska and Hawaii, but don't easily fit on my slide. But this is where we have forests today in the United States. And you can see right away that that follows the same pattern. There's an eastern forest pattern from Texas to Maine, Florida to Minnesota. There's a Rocky Mountain forest pattern here, and there's a Pacific coastal forest pattern. So the first thing that we realize is that, of course, it's one thing to have ecological capacity to grow trees. Another part of that is it's somewhat an ecological limitation as well, that forests grow where forests can grow. And so just like the ecological capacity in the Midwest is for grasslands, that also means forests won't thrive there. You can, like I said, you can have trees there, especially in low areas or riparian areas near streams or those kinds of things. But to have abundant forests like you see in the Eastern US is, is really a different level of ecological capacity. So the good news is we have lots of areas in the US that can grow trees that have that ecological capacity, but we also have to recognize we can't grow trees very well in areas outside of those eco regions. So it is, uh, it is one of those relationships that's important to understand. The other thing to understand in this, in this slide is these darkest green areas. These are areas where we have significant forest area expansion. In fact, in the past 20 years, the total forest area in the United States has increased by 3%, which means we now have more than 765 million acres of forest in the US. 765 million acres of forest. It is the largest single land use that we have. The only way that you, I mean, that's the cropland and ranch land. If you combine some other land uses, you might hold a candle to forestry, but really 765 million acres is the largest single land use that we have, and it's been expanding. The darkest green areas on this map represent areas that since 1997 have had a 50% increase in forest land. So we continue to gain forest land. And there's a, we'll talk a little bit about some of the reasons for that, but it really is a significant testament to both our ecology as well as how much we value forests in this country and that we really have prioritized them across the landscape and continue to do so. Now that an ecological map, the ecoregion map, where we had the eastern forest, the boreal forest, that Rocky Mountain forest, the Pacific coastal forest, if all of the ecoregions in that map that can grow forests were totally maxed out with forests, every acre that could possibly have, tree, have trees had trees, the maximum ecological capacity in what is now the United States is about a billion acres of forest. That's pretty much our, our maximum forest area. If we, if we put trees everywhere that we could, that the ecology could support trees. So to have 765 million acres out of a possible billion, in my opinion, is pretty darn good. And when you look at this map, you can tell where we've created gaps in our forest area. And the major place that we've created gaps in our forest area in the United States is in this eastern temperate region, where if you remember from the eco-region map, Everything basically east of the Mississippi has the ecological capacity to grow trees. But we have converted areas of that forest land predominantly into agricultural regions, the Ohio River Valley, you know, across Illinois and Indiana, Ohio, in the Mississippi River Valley. These are areas that historically would have been forested, but today we use them for other land uses, very important land uses. But that's one of the regions where when people try to figure out how would we get back to a billion acres or where did the other acres go, that's one of the big answers. Part of it is also where we've had development. You look into some of our communities and where we've had conversion of forest areas around development, those kinds of things. But a big part of it is conversion to agriculture that happened you know, about beginning about 150 years ago, pretty significantly in that region. So this is where we have forests in the United States and where forests are growing in the United States. And one of the key things to understand with this is not just the ecology, that supports the growing of trees and forests, but also the economy and how much that directly relates to where we have forests and where we have forests expanding and thriving. So this is a map that shows forest industry in the United States, specifically this is sawmills, so it's just one part of the forest industry, but you can instantly see how the presence of the forest industry corresponds to the regions where we have forests and even to where we have forests expanding and growing. And that is not an accident, and I think for some people, sometimes it's counterintuitive to think that forest industry um, would be a positive feedback loop for where we have forests, but that's exactly how it works. 
We have forests where forests are valued, where they're part of the economy, where there's an economic engine to continue supporting forests as a, as a land use decision. Because across this country, especially in the East United States, the majority of our, of our rural lands are privately owned. And so having markets and having an economic engine for those landowners is very important. And what we see is um, regions with strong forest markets, those forest markets can go toe to toe with alternative agricultural markets. And so there are many parts, especially in the Eastern United States where we've had forests respond and recover in what were formerly agricultural areas. And that's, that's the story across much of the Eastern US. Uh, areas that historically were agriculture at some point in the last several hundred years, and today they're covered with trees. This is a picture from Massachusetts, and on the left, it's this region in the 1880s, and on the right, it's how it looks currently. You know, the picture's from 2010, but it's how it looks currently. And this story is repeated over and over throughout the eastern U.S. When you're east of the Mississippi River, uh, almost every acre you're looking at has a history of you know, this type of change, uh, whether it's, um, you know, some of the, the further east you are, and some of this change happened a very long ago, and certainly some of this land use change is preceded by uh, Native American tri tribal activities and land management activities that predate European settlement. That's certainly part of the history of the U.S. Uh, in the western U.S. and the eastern U.S., throughout the U.S. But this transition between predominantly agricultural uses and then, trans then transitioning into forestry today is a, is a big reason why we have these expanding forest areas. And this, is, this happened in part because agriculture moved out of the east and into the Midwest. Um, and so landowners in the east look at for other land uses. And because they're in an ecological region that can grow trees, that's a viable choice. And because there's markets available uh, for the products from those forests, it also makes it an econ economically viable and sustainable choice for those landowners. So this is a great story of forest recovery in the eastern United States, but I'd also say that it's also a story about restoration needs and um, trying to recover forests after an era of pretty heavy impact. Uh, agricultural, I mean, land clearing, grazing, cropping systems, all of the land uses you see depicted in that left-hand picture have a pretty significant impact on trees, on soils on all kinds of ecological factors that determine the health of the, of the subsequent forest. So in the eastern United States, a lot of the work in forestry and forest ecology today is all about restoration and really trying to restore the elements of biodiversity and health within this recovering forest landscape. Because one of the things you see in that right-hand picture is to me in many, by many measures, a historic kind of overabundance of white pine. White pine is a pretty aggressive species coming into old fields and old farmlands in the Northeast. And historically, it wouldn't be as dominant as what you see in that right-hand picture. So over time, ecologists and foresters in the East look at those factors and, and through management help to diversify, increase the biodiversity and the health, the resilience of that recovering forest in the East. And that's a lot of the work that continues to go on in the East, to learn from history um, and then to to plan for a resilient forest going forward with everything that we, we've learned. In the Western United States, the ecology and the, and the challenges around forests are very different. Um, it really isn't a history of farming and that kind of land use change. There's some of that. Certainly there's some ranching that has impacted forest resources and some farming. But the dominant ecological influence in the East that's also informing our management today as we look for how do we support a sustainable forest resource and, and really uh, be part of making it as resilient and vibrant as possible. The dominant issue in the West is wildfire and the risk of wildfire. So this is a series of pictures from Oregon. And this first picture is from 1909. And you can see a gentleman standing here. And you can see that the forest is, is pretty open. You know, you could go for a walk here or I don't know, you could, I mean, it's, it's pretty wide open, great for a park or a picnic, this kind of thing. By 1948, you can see that some trees have started to grow in, fill in a little bit. This guy is still standing there. I'm assuming he's really tired by now. I'm joking. I'm hoping it's probably his, his child or a relative. Anyway, I hope he wasn't standing there for, you know, 40 some years. 
But uh, by 1958, it started to grow in more. 68, you can see as well. 79, it's very thick. And by 1989, 80 years after that first picture, it's a, it's a thicket. It's not wide open. You're not going for a hike or having a picnic. I mean, this is a very thick forest. And this, this change in forest conditions is repeated in many regions of the West. And it is a result of this time period starting in the early 1900s and going through almost the 1980s, but this time period that was dominated by a policy of fire suppression. In the early 1900s, there were some horribly devastating fires. And following that, um, the policy was put in place to suppress fires, put out fires as quickly as possible and prevent them. And when you prevent fires in, in these regions, trees will fill in, whereas historically, fire may have come through periodically uh, and kept that understory open, like you see in the first picture. In the absence of fire, the understory fills in and you end up with a, a very different condition. So there's a couple things that ecologists focus on with this. One is that all of these pictures you see are natural forests. I mean, it, it's a reminder that forests can exist in many different conditions in any given place, given whatever factors are influencing that forest. So infrequent fire, frequent fire, low intensity fire, high intensity fire, it'll just determine what type of forest you have, the absence of fire, whatever. So forests are naturally diverse things and they can occur in many different ways across the landscape. So all of these forests are natural in the sense that they represent different forest types that can occur in this landscape. But each of these forests have different impacts on water quality, wildlife, and fire risk. And we know that the type of forest that we see in this last picture is overabundant on the landscape. There's more of it than you would have maybe had in the past. And there's more of it than is really sustainable because this forest type is highly susceptible to high intensity fire that can be devastating to wildlife and water quality and creates risks to public safety as well. So when we talk about forest ecology in the West, it isn't so much that we want every acre to look like it did 100 years ago. We, we still want this mix across the landscape, but we just got to decide how much of which types of forests and where they're located and how they're cared for to manage some of those impacts and also make sure we get the benefits we want. So the wildfire question out west is definitely the dominant question, and it's a complicated question, and it has emerged into a gr growing understanding that we have millions of acres out west, tens of millions of acres out west that are at high risk for wildfire. It's very expensive to send people out there to treat those acres, especially when there is no market for the material that has to be removed from those acres. So the, the challenge and the opportunity that has been brought up in many parts of the United States, especially in the west, is asking the question of what is the role of forest products and the use of forest products in helping to restore our forests and helping to increase the sustainability and the resiliency in, in our forest, including reducing the risk of wildfire. And in that same conversation, that's where the whole question about sustainability comes up and making sure that if we are going to care for our forests, including the reduction of wildfire risk through the removal of materials, that we're doing that in a responsible way. And that's, that's exactly what we'll get into a little bit more, but that's a, a core part of why we're talking about wood as a sustainable material because of that connection back to the landscape, the health of the forest, and how important forest, forest product markets are in achieving those goals. So I want to shift away a little bit from ecology and touch on uh, some other materials and really start to get at this issue of why we have an opportunity to use wood within our built environment, within our industrial operations, wherever we see a role for wood, why we have why that's such an important opportunity how that contributes to sustainability and um and, and how that feeds back into the forest so one thing uh, i just want to touch on it you know is just wood consumption or raw material consumption you know the materials that we use in our economy and so this slide shows that um you know population growth over the last 50 some years globally our population has been grown about 2.45 times during that time period so, you know, more than double our population during that time period. But our consumption of some materials has been growing at an even faster rate. So if you look at steel, 
almost five times as much steel consumed um, today as there was at the beginning of the time period. Cement, more than 12 times. Aluminum, plastic, more than 25 times as much plastic consumed today, even though our population has only increased two and a half times. But then you look at wood and you look at the fact that our wood consumption is not even keeping pace with population growth. And on the one hand, part of the reason is because we've become much more efficient in how we utilize wood in terms of um, using the byproduct from manufacturing to, to make composite products and all these kinds of things. So that is part of the story here that we have eliminated waste within much of our primary wood using industry. So our consumption is much more efficient than it was at the beginning of this time period. But it also speaks to the fact that for the last 50 some years, economies have looked at plastic, cement, steel, some of these other materials have really taken um, a, a big part of our economy and our growth. And I would just propose that there's an opportunity to look closer at how we use wood and to um, look for opportunities for wood to be a bigger part of our material use pattern. So I want to touch on these different materials, you know, steel, I'll touch a little on concrete, a little on plastic, um, and just to, to get at the issues of, you know, the trade-offs in these materials and how we really then think about the sustainability around these materials. So when it comes to steel, the U.S. is a very large importer of steel. Uh, we produce, you know, right around 10 million metric tons per year. We import 30, 36 million tons. So primarily we are a steel importer. Our top places we import from Canada is number one but this map is showing the top 10 regions of the world that we import steel from so Brazil being number two and and you can see South Korea uh, Mexico Russia Turkey these other countries that we import from so steel is a major uh, import product for the US and it's, it's similar with aluminum I, um, aluminum we make less than a million metric tons of aluminum in the US each year and we import about five million metric tons. So it, it's similar in terms of um, it being a major import. And, and one of the challenges that come with importing materials is when we look at the supply chain risks associated with where materials are coming from. So this is one of the things um, that, that we look at globally, nationally, I, and or internationally, excuse me. And it's, what this is called is a corruption perception index. And where you look at the rule of law and the occurrences of corruption, as well as the systems that respond to those occurrences, and the countries can be ranked on a, on a corruption perception index. And this is a situation where a higher number is better, a lower number means a higher risk of corruption. And so the nations that you see in yellow and shades of orange, I mean, including Canada, the US, Western Europe, Finland, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Japan, these nations, have a low level of risk for corruption. And that means there's lower risk of you know, liabilities, illegality practices that would create risk within a supply chain. And the nations in red uh, have a much higher risk within this corruption perception index. And what you see, of course, is that some of the nations that we import materials from have a pretty um, you know, high risk of corruption. And that's and the corruption perception index, I mean, this is not material specific. I mean, this is a ranking of nations. Uh, and so materials from those nations, irregardless of what material can be associated with this kind of risk. And so this is one of the things we think about when we think about importing materials from around the world. Within forestry, there has been a lot of concern around illegal logging and how illegal logging can contribute to the loss of forest resources and degradation of forest resources. So within the forest sector, there have been governments, private and public sector uh, interests that have investigated corruption and illegal forest activity risks within the forest sector. And the results are similar to what you saw on that first slide, where when we rank the, the percentage of suspicious log supply versus this high corruption, there's a bunch of countries that fall out as low, low risk in terms of suspicious log supply or corruption, you know, Canada, U.S., EU, Japan, I mean, these are low risk countries when it comes to potentially legal or logging. And then other nations, just like you saw on that previous map, that tend to be higher risk for some of these practices, corruption and illegal logging. And so we know that these differences occur when we look at uh, import markets. 
This map shows something very similar when we look at um, wood flows around the world. And so the U.S., uh, the EU being major imported, major main, the main importer shown on this map, the countries in brown being producer countries. And so the arrows show the flow of materials, wood materials in this case. And then the, each of these little pie charts show the, the percentage or the division with red being the, the amount of illegal logging within that country. And so, you know, you look at some regions, you know, about half, more than half of the logging is, is estimated to be illegal. And illegal means you're talking about labor violations, safety violations, trespass, where you're harvesting materials from areas that are supposed to be protected, or you're taking species that are supposed to be protected. I mean, illegal logging has a bunch of different considerations, whether they're environmental laws that are being broken or, or social laws or economic laws. But it, it can be a, a range of issues that contribute to the definition of illegal logging. But that's what we see, is that flows of material from these countries that are known to be high risk coming into U.S. supply chains. The other thing that has been done within the forest sector to really try and um, raise awareness and sensitivity and also look for opportunities to improve the situation. But what's been done is a timber risk score ranking. This has been done for more than a decade. It was recently updated again in 2019. And this is similar where a high number is what you want. Uh, green shows the lowest risk regions of the world. Red are the highest risk. Um, and if you go to this website, you can read a full report of what they, what they analyze in determining this risk. But again, you can see that North America is distinctly different than many other parts of the world in terms of having a very good timber risk score, which relates to not having the same issues with illegal logging, whether it's environmental, social, or uh, economic types of violations that might occur within the sourcing of wood materials. So Canada and the U.S. are considered uh, very low risk areas for sourcing wood products. And like I said before, these similarities between risk, they're not necessarily material specific. Some of the underlining factors that, deter that contribute to a, uh, a low timber risk score or a bad, I should say, a, a bad timber risk score or a high risk score, some of those factors have, have very little to do with forestry. They really have to do with operations within that country and uh, the legal structures that would prevent illegal activity irregardless of what material. So one thing I wanted to touch on, you know, is also, you know, I mentioned how in the U.S. there's that correlation between where we have forest industry and where we have forest resources. Well, that correlation also occurs globally. So this is one of those maps that's meant to kind of make your head spin or something. But what's happening in this map is the countries are disproportionately portrayed based upon their protect, production of forest products. And this would be, you know, higher value kind of forest products, processed forest products, not round wood, but, you know, value added forest products. So what you see in this map is North America, parts of Europe, China, where we have much greater forest product production. They're, they're disproportionately enlarged on this map to represent their contribution to global forest product production. Whereas other parts of the world, especially Africa, you know, these, those regions are made smaller as a representation of their smaller contribution to forest product production. And this is a map that shows forest area change around the world. And what you see in this map is some of those same regions that where we produce a lot of forest products, North America, Western Europe, um, and even China. You know, what you see is there, these, those nations are in white or green, and white means that the forest area is stable. Green means that the forest area is increasing. Um, but these regions where we have a lot of forest product production are actually increasing the forest area, whereas regions where we don't have a forest industry very well developed are less likely and are less likely to be adding forest and much more likely to be losing forest area. And so that's that when we look around the world and people ask, well, how can we turn the tide and change the impact on forest resources? One of the things is looking at how different nations can develop their forest industries to be doing more domestic use and, and more value-added processing within their country. So there's a lot more to unpack there when we look at that relationship between the environmental and economic trends we see around forests globally, but we do see this correlation between 
forest product production and the expansion of forest resources in many parts of the world. So it's always asked, you know, so, okay, if we start using more wood, you know, I mean, can we really do that? Do we have enough wood out there? It sounds like we have a lot of forest and we have a lot of ecological capacity to grow trees, but do we actually have enough wood that we could support, you know, increased use of wood within our, within our practices, within our industries? And so what this is showing is this net annual growth in U.S. forests. And on the left, net, this is net annual growth. And so this is a growth that occurs every year, and it's net. We've subtracted out wildfire impacts or insect or disease or harvesting, whatever. We've subtracted out anything, um, you know, impacting the growth of trees on an annual basis. So the net annual growth in the United States is about 215 billion board feet. Our annual harvest in the United States are about half of that. So on an annual basis, we're growing nearly twice as much as we use. And so we have about 110 billion board feet to play with in terms of, you know, this margin that we can work within. And so it's a, and a, it, these numbers are so big. I think sometimes it's even hard to wrap our head around, you know, the numbers that we're talking about. But for example, I'm sure you've all seen some of the predictions lately about increasing mass timber construction and tall wood buildings. And even if we look at the most aggressive projection for mass timber construction, it might dip into 7% of this available 110 billion board feet. Those are even some of the most optimistic or aggressive projections of mass timber. So this is a very large amount of wood that's available. And this is also when we look at the urgency of using more of this wood, that's when it comes back to that conversation about reducing wildfire risk. I mean, part of the reason we have so much excess wood here is because of those, those dense forests in the west that are more prone to wildfire. Also where we have forests in the east that could benefit from management that would increase their biodiversity. But that's, that's part of what's going on in these numbers is we're talking about a forest resources, resource that is abundant and growing. But if we have markets for that material, we could improve the conditions of those forests, reduce the wildfire risks in those forests, and even increase some of the resiliency and biodiversity of those forests. So there's an opportunity here to utilize wood and for the use of that wood to feed back into some responsible forest management across the landscape. And if we look at Canada, the, the situation is pretty similar. This is just a different way, you know, it's displayed in Canada. The, the lines to focus on at the top line is total wood supply. So that's kind of like that net annual growth line, but this is total wood supply over this is going back to 1990 and then total harvest is this orange line so the, these other ones break down between hardwood and softwood this kind of thing but total harvest or excuse me total wood supply is the top line orange line is the total harvest you can see the impact of the recession in terms of the housing collapse but you can see the gap between total wood supply and total harvest there's a lot of room there for additional use of wood within um within Canada as well. And you can see that this kind of margin between the total wood supply and the total harvest is well established. And it's the same thing if you look at that in the US. These lines have a gap between them and, and, it's, and we monitor this. And so we do know when our demands on the forest have changed. I mean, we do know how that, how that sustainability is measured over time so we can modify as needed. So I want to touch, I touched on a little bit on steel, a lot on wood. Um, I want to touch a little bit on plastics. I mean, this is a whole nother material and a whole nother set of sustainability concerns. But when, it, when we come to looking at plastics, it's, it's kind of the opposite of some of these other things. The U.S. is a major exporter of plastics. And this chart is really busy, lots of details. The main thing I want you just to focus on is these arrows are heading out. When it comes to plastics, the U.S. sends plastics and plastic waste all over the world. And we send those plastics to parts of the world that are also associated with some of the information we showed before related to supply chain risk and the corruption perception index. But this is a different, it, it's a different trade flow when it comes to plastics. because the U.S. exports plastic uh, to a large degree. And, and one of the things we look at when it comes to sustainability and environmental impacts with that is, like I said, where these plastic exports are going. And so this was a chart that was put together uh, after China started indicating they wouldn't take 
plastic for recycling as much anymore. So nations want to look at, well, if China's not going to take it, where might these um, plastics end up? And so this just shows for these different countries, including the U.S., you know, where these, when we export plastic for, presumably for recycling, but when we export plastic waste, where is it ending up? And it shows, you know, going to Malaysia, the red line's going to China, Hong Kong, other Asian countries, and then other parts of the world as well. Um, but we know that we export a lot of plastic waste. It's going into countries where there are concerns that it is either not being recycled efficiency, efficiently, like using older technologies that are more polluting, or not being recycled at all, and it's being illegally dumped, um, illegally disposed of in those countries. So this is a real concern with plastic in terms of understanding those trade flows and, and the global impacts of those trade flows in terms of environmental uh, pollution and, and impacts within the countries that are taking those materials. So, sh I, so shifting gears yet again, I want to get into some of the details of how we quantify environmental impact. I mentioned this at the beginning, looking at life cycle assessments and looking at some of these cradle to grave types of studies where we can really kind of do side by side comparisons between materials and, and get an idea of what their environmental impacts are and what the trade offs might be. So, a cradle to grave life cycle assessment, it will look at everything from raw material extraction to manufacturing, packaging and transport, how that material is used and even the end of life uh, outcomes for that material. And this is a really important one in terms of end of life assumptions for whether the material will be disposed of, used, recovered for recycling, or repurposed, reused in some way. The cradle to grave life cycle assessment attempts to look at all of these considerations within the life cycle of a, of a product, a material, a process, whatever they might be looking at, but we'll be looking at materials. And life cycle assessment is guided by ISO standards. There's ISO standards for how to do an LCA, and those are applied internationally. And it, it includes everything from, you know, defining the, the scope. Sometimes there are parts of a life cycle that there isn't available information, so that might be out of the scope for some reason, or you may have to use some different assumptions there. But then there's a whole inventory analysis, impact assessment, interpreting those results, really trying to use those results to inform uh, design or, or product development or processes to reduce impacts based upon the information, and that's how it gets applied. One of the most common uses for life cycle assessment is an individual company will do an LCA internally. They'll look at a particular product or a particular process, and they'll try to determine where is the waste occurring or wh what is the, you kind of like a sensitivity analysis to identify where within that product or process are, is the greatest opportunity for improvement you know, whether it's, you know, energy consumption or some other consideration. But LCA is commonly used internally within an individual company to help inform improvement within their processes or products. It also can be used across a sector. Information can be aggregated to look at different materials or different products or processes that are across a sector, and you can inform practice more broadly. But this is an example of the result of a life cycle assessment. Um, this is comparing the, the effluents or the emissions associated with steel or wood framed walls. It, but the, you know, the information relates to overall material, wood versus steel in general. But this gives you an idea of the types of things that a life cycle assessment will look at and kind of the level of detail that you can really get into. So this is looking at carbon dioxide and all kinds of other emissions and uh, it gets into, I mean, particulates and all kinds of different things that, that are associated with different materials and quantifies these, measures them throughout that life cycle to make a comparison between the two materials. And what you really see in this study is that the magnitude of difference, I mean, the, the type of environmental impact associated with using steel in this situation or in this application rather than using wood it's anything from you know, 1.6 times the impact to 41 times the impact, depending on which measure of impact you're looking at. I mean, these are, these are significant differences in terms of the trade-offs between these materials and the types of environmental impacts that are associated with them. Now, we all know that all kinds of materials are absolutely essential. So to me, so much of what I'm talking about, the goal isn't to say that you know, one material or another material is bad or good. It's, it, it's to understand the trade-offs between them and then look for the opportunities to adjust our decisions accordingly to, to influence our overall environmental impact. 
This is really about having well-informed decision-making when we look at our material trade-offs. So recognizing that within our built environment, within our industries, there is a role for all kinds of materials, all materials to be used uh, where appropriate. This is, uh, what this does is you take the life cycle assessment and rather than having all of those findings itemized line by line, you can aggregate them together into impact categories. And so this is looking at embodied energy, you know, emissions, global warming kind of thing. And then again, you can see that the difference um, where the steel impact is, you know, 11 to 33 percent higher, depending on what you're looking here. And this is looking at above grade exterior walls, floor and roof assemblies, but these are similar, um, you know, for other types of applications. The one exception here is solid waste. Within this application, we know that within construction, at a construction site, there can sometimes be more uh, wood wood waste that occurs within within this type of environment. So in that particular instance, uh, wood may not perform as well as steel because there'll be more on-site trimming or, or waste that occurs with it. One of the things I mentioned, life cycle assessment looks at end of life assumptions and assuming recycled or recyclability can be a big impact on you know how a life cycle analysis you know, what the conclusions and findings are, because um, recycling can reduce the environmental impacts of materials. Uh, and we know that for iron, steel, there's a bunch of information out there about recycling, and, and recycling is really important, and the industry certainly has acknowledged the importance of recycling. But we also know that there's many, there's different ways to calculate recycled content, and when it comes to steel, those numbers can be all over the board, ranging from as low as 28% recycled up to 90%. And some of the higher estimates, what's happening is they're basing that recycled rate on materials already being collected. So it's materials collected for recycling, and then what percentage of those collected materials get recycled. And that's really where those highest estimates come from. So bottom line, you know, there's different ways of estimating recycling, and it's important to look at those assumptions when you're, when you're judging that end-of-life uh, assumption and estimate within a, within a comparison study. I want to touch just a tiny bit on plastic life cycle assessments. I know plastic bags aren't maybe your the greatest interest, um, but the, this is looking at all of these different studies that were done comparing different consumer uh, shopping bags. And what it shows is if the box is shaded, it means that the study looked at like all five types versus this study only looked at two types, this kind of thing. And where you see the letters, it means that, that that's the type of bag that the study found to have the lowest impact. So when you look at life cycle assessments, they'll commonly find that thin plastic bags are very low impact. And that kind of is counterintuitive sometimes because we think of plastic as high, having a high environmental impact. But really what happens in these life cycle assessments is they're finding that because plastic bags are so lightweight, you know, you think of it, you can stuff one in your pocket, where you can't stuff other types of bags in your pocket necessarily, but because they're so lightweight, the impacts from transportation and all of those kinds of things are greatly reduced. So the main thing here is to remind ourselves that life cycle assessments can't answer everything. They really are limited by what they can measure and what they can quantify, and they can't take into account some of the other impacts that occur within materials, including the types of pollution degradation that we see from some plastic materials. One of the ways that forest products address those other types of impacts that can't be accounted for within plastic, or excuse me, within an LCA, is the use of certification as a supplementary measure that tells us more about the product. And so this is a map showing certified forests around the world. And the United States has about 9% of the world's certified forest. Canada has about 40%. And these are voluntary programs that tell us a lot more about the forest resources. Within the United States, about 20% of our forest lands are now certified. These are voluntary programs. There's three different programs that operate in North America, and they provide a great deal of insight into the forest management. Canada is similar, that you can see here, the amount of forest in Canada, and then also the amount that's certified. There's a, Canada has a great deal of certified forests as well. So the last thing I want to touch on very quickly is just forest carbon and carbon impact. And what this is looking at is that with, when it comes to forests, we can store carbon within the forest soils, within the litter residues of the forest floor, as well as within the trees. And over time, that forest storage, that carbon storage increases, 
but then when trees die or trees are harvested, it might decrease, but then it recovers as the trees regrow and that cycle continues. And what we know is there's an opportunity not only to store carbon in the forest with these forest carbon stocks, but where we can also store carbon in timber and forest products. And when we do both of those things, we really get the maximum benefit. So this chart is showing carbon storage in the forest, just like that first slide. But then when those trees are harvested, it goes into forest products. So this is that carbon storage there. And if those forest products are used instead of concrete, you avoid the emissions that would be associated with concrete. So when it comes to using forest products and carbon storage, we can store carbon in the forest, in products, and we can avoid higher emitting materials. Because this chart just shows the carbon emissions associated with different materials and the significant differences in terms of very low emissions associated with lumber versus steel and concrete. Because wood products, they're re reusable, biodegradable, they store carbon, and that's what makes them such a sustainable choice. And so lastly, I know I'm getting close to time, Warren. So the conclusions, just to recap, because I know I covered a lot of ground and some of it is probably not uh, as familiar to you all as it is to me. But just recognizing that ecology, that it's so important, it's the underlining determinant of our forest sustainability and the abundant forest resources that we have in North America. Recognizing that risks do exist within global supply chains and import, imported materials. Life cycle assessment quantifies impacts. It allows us to measure things, but it can't necessarily measure everything. And so certification provides us an additional assurance, but forest products are the only major materials that have implemented certification programs, and they really should be demanded for other materials since similar risks can occur within other supply chains, not just for forest products. The carbon benefits, they exist within the forest and also storing carbon within our forest products and through substitution. So at the end of the day, forest products from responsible sources, they support forest growth and they make wood a sustainable material. So I'm happy to take any questions and uh, I pass it back to you, Warren. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, we did have a couple of questions. We're bumping up against time, so uh, we'll touch on these uh, rather quickly. And then again, the Q&A will be posted uh, on our website. So we had a couple of questions come in about clear cutting. Uh, how does clear cutting fit in? Uh, how does the forest successfully restore, uh, rebuild itself when clear cutting is the method? Uh, so just if you could touch on clear cutting a little bit. Absolutely. And like I mentioned, I mean, clear cutting is kind of an antiquated term. And the way that we do regeneration harvest or even age management today is with, with much greater sensitivity and maintains the structural elements that a forest needs to respond in terms of resilient soil conditions and also making sure that there's a plan there for either replanting or naturally regenerating the next forest. So clear cutting fits in in terms of it is the way that um, many forests respond. It, it, I mean, clear cutting isn't terribly different sometimes than wind disturbance or some of the things that naturally happen to forests, including wildfire. So forests can respond very positively, but we do it in ways today that help ensure that positive response by planning for that next forest effectively. Great. Um, we'll just take this question uh, and, and close. Um, illegal foresting. Uh, is that monitored on a global scale or uh, only within the country? Both. Illegal logging is, there's um, work that goes on in country and then there's analysis and aggregating of trends that happens globally uh, through different international organizations. Great. Um, Thank you, Katie. It was an excellent presentation. Again, if we didn't get to your questions, look for the uh, Q&A on our website. Um, before we conclude, I've got, I'd like to touch on uh, three things really quickly. Uh, first, a short survey, uh, then the CEUs and upcoming webinars. Uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback via the survey that you'll receive shortly. So uh, please take a minute and fill that out. Also, don't forget to download the AIA or ICC Certificate of Completion from the links in the follow-up email that will be sent to you about an hour after the webinar ends today. And finally, make sure that you are signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you will be notified of our next webinar.
as well as future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. To receive it, all you need to do, starting from the home page of our website, is click on the sign in in the upper right hand corner of the page. In the menu that drops down, simply select register. From there, you will need to let us know what you'd specifically like to receive, which in this case is the APA update newsletter. I should mention that if you have technical questions on any topic related to the use of engineered wood products, don't hesitate to contact the APA help desk at the address shown here. We also have APA field staff available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials. Their individual contact information can be found on our APA website, apawood.org. Please feel free to reach out and take advantage of this resource. As mentioned earlier, a recording of today's webinar, a PDF of the slides, and answers to the questions that were asked will be posted at apawood.org in a week or two. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending and have a great day.